Hello, everyone. I am Brandon Lewis, founder of the Tennessee Conservative. Today, Congressman Scott Desjardins, representing Tennessee in the 4th Congressional District, joins us once again. Uh, Dr. D will be giving us a preview of the Biden administration's State of the State address, albeit from a conservative perspective. Uh, Congressman Desjardins is one of the most conservative uh, voting congressmen in the state of Tennessee and our U.S. House delegation. As a result, he has received awards and commendations from the Heritage Foundation, American Serv Conservative Union, Americans for Prosperity, and Numbers USA, which deals with immigration reform. He serves on the uh, House Committee on Arms Services and also Agriculture. He is a member of the um, Conservative House Freedom Caucus. We're hoping to get one of those in our state legislature, as well as the GOP Doctors Caucus and Border Security Caucus. I've known him for a long time, and he and his wife, uh, Amy, live in Sherwood. They have a beautiful daughter named Maggie and a not-so-little son named Tyler now, who recently got engaged. So congratulations, Dad, and welcome back to the program. Glad to be back, Brandon. Awesome. So tonight we will be hearing from Joe Biden in his State of the Union address with a roaring economy, low energy prices, world peace, a secure border and racial harmony. Now reality in the USA. What could Republicans possibly have to complain about? Yeah, I mean, what could go wrong, right? He, he's in, uh, in fine shape. I'm guessing that speech has been rewritten and is being rewritten today. Uh, it's like from two years ago. There, there's not much going right. I don't know what he hangs his hat on. I'm sure he's going to talk a little bit about his Supreme Court pick, which is interesting, uh, his, his strategy on that. He, he, maybe he'll talk about the diversity of his cabinet. Uh, maybe he's going to talk about how you know gas prices shouldn't go much above five or six dollars a gallon. We just need to suck it up. Uh, because you know why would he why would he turn the Keystone Pipeline uh, pro project back on? Why would he continue to uh, explore oil in this country when we can buy it from the Russians or you know simply buy it from Iran or the Middle East? So I, I'm not sure exactly what he's going to talk about tonight, Brandon. You know, the the border, of course, is a disaster. The the parents are mad as hornets over masking and over critical race theory and being told to butt out of their kids' uh, education. Uh, everyone's feeling it when they go to the grocery store. We see what's unfolding on a world stage. We got uh, Russia and Ukraine. We got China you know, wanting to go into Taiwan. Iran's wanting to get nuclear weapons. North Korea's firing missiles again. So, yeah, it, it ought to be an interesting speech to try to weave and, and put lipstick on that pig. Well, it's kind of funny. Everything the liberals predicted that Trump would do, he didn't, yet Joe Biden has. Uh, it is amazing how that, that tends to, to go down. So what is your best guess about how the mainstream media will spin this speech? Uh, I mean, have things finally gotten bad enough, uh, even with, with Tennessee's media, which loves Joe Biden and has and hated Trump all the way through every, every broadsheet you open up in our state is, you know, this love affair with Biden, this hatred of Trump, despite the realities of their job performance. Do you think things have finally gotten bad enough where they might, at least temporarily, while, you know, just for a short period of time, might rediscover some journalistic integrity? Well, see, I like to follow the late night comedians. And, and once they start attacking Biden, you know, he could be in trouble. You know, the media is going to protect him uh, the best they can. But it's hard to defend poll numbers that uh, are, are dipping below 40 percent. A lot of people in his own party aren't approving. And uh, as you say, in Tennessee, we have a pretty liberal media, but they've got a very conservative audience. So how with a straight face they can spin this in a positive way, I don't know. It, it seems like they're tempering things a little bit. I'm, I'm like you. I think that's a great question. I'm curious to see how they'll cover this uh, with a straight face because there's not a lot of good things to report. And I, I'm sure that he'll focus on uh, uh, his infrastructure bill. You know, he's maybe, I don't know if he'll go into Build Back Better, which has been dead in the water. He's going to probably bring up the need for voting rights because you know they see the midterm slipping away and they're <clears throat> poll numbers sinking and, and they know that the strategy they used against President Trump where they changed the rules in so many states the legislature set or had set uh, you know they, they know that that was effective in places like Pennsylvania and, and Georgia so they want to codify those and go against the uh, uh, constitutional way our elections are set up and change those rules and federalize it so you know, I'm guessing he's going to talk about those things he uh, he'll have to be careful 
on Ukraine, because even though the Ukrainians have put up a, a heck of a good fight, uh, there's a 30, 40 mile column of armored vehicles heading into Kiev to surround it. And I'm afraid things are going to get uh, worse before they get better. But we can get into more on Ukraine in a, in a minute if you have time. But uh, yeah, I'm curious to, to listen to this tonight because it's going to be pretty hard to spin and it's going to be hard for the media to make it look good. Well, since you are on the Armed Services Committee, it, talk about what's going on over there. You know, I've it's hard for me because I keep focused on Tennessee almost exclusively, but I've watched a lot of the coverage. Apparently, there's a large convoy that's heading into uh, Ukraine. But, you know, then again, the Russians uh, spent a whole lot of time in treasure trying to take over Afghanistan. That didn't go very well. Uh, hopefully, the people uh, of Ukraine will, will give a similar uh, gutsy fight. What are you hearing? What do you think the chances are that they could at least stymie them or maybe even rebuff them with all the weapons being sent over? Right. I mean, they have weapons, albeit in fear. They put on a good fight. My, my hunch is that uh, Biden wanted this to look a little more surgical. He, he didn't want it to get bloody with a high body count. And it's getting worse, it seems, by the day. He took Crimea under Obama and Biden without much fuss. And, you know, he was able to essentially occupy a lot of eastern Ukraine uh, for some time now. But, um, you know, he, he massed those troops. We've seen that coming from a mile away. We've been watching it. We've been having classified briefings on it. It was interesting that some of the European countries that you think would be uh, a little more on edge, like Estonia or Latvia, or Poland, Romania, the, you know, the former Eastern Bloc countries. I was there and visited several of those countries. I was in Ukraine, went to Kiev, went east to Dnipro. And uh, I don't think at the end of the day, they really thought that they would invade on this scale. But I think the scars of war from World War II are alive and well right now. You see the Europeans really stepping up and responding. In fact, I think they've led and we've followed uh, to some extent on amassing troops with, uh, within the NATO system along those uh, countries I just mentioned. You see Germany uh, blocking Nord Stream when Biden was hesitant to do it after they did it. Oh yeah, we, we need to shut down Nord Stream 2. You see the Swiss Bank of all people getting involved and, and cutting off funding and uh, you know, so I think Europe uh, remembers all too well what uh, Hitler did and, and uh, see Putin acting the way he is seems a little unhinged, even for Putin. Uh, I, I think that they're wide awake now and they're uh, giving a very appropriate measured response. Putin's threatening them. Any country that helps Ukraine uh, is next in their crosshairs. And that's a pretty big threat because if he uh, involves Germany or Poland or any of those company, uh, countries, then Article 5 of NATO kicks in. And uh, unfortunately, you're staring at World War III. Mm -hmm. Well, let's hope it doesn't come to that. <clears throat> I think as Americans, we've, we've grown up in the lap of luxury without a whole lot of conflict, uh, really since Vietnam in our, in our country. I and mean, we did have, uh, you know, all of the uh, altercations in the Middle East, of course, but in, in size and scope and, 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 and really... I guess, uh, conscription or draft measures. We've never seen that in our country. And, and hopefully this may slap us back into some kind of reality that we have bigger problems uh, than the ones that we often kind of squ uh, quabble about here or quibble about here in our country. So what do you think your predictions are in the midterms? Where do you see that going in the House and the Senate? I mean, typically the pendulum swings back and forth almost every single time. Occasionally a party will get lucky and hang up, hang on. Hang on. I don't see that in this situation, but uh, just kind of give me your give me your opinion about the midterms. What do you think? Well, from, from my perspective, not much is going right. OK, we're, we're losing jobs. Uh, people aren't working. They've changed the, the waging to where, you know, people are leaving manufacturing jobs to go work at McDonald's because this $15 an hour thing that everybody wanted. Well, now you have it. Now you have your $10 Big Macs. And uh, it, you know, it's, it's just playing out as we thought. And so I, I think the crisis at the southern border is just absolutely undeniable what's happening there. The inflow of of drugs, the amount of resources that uh, the illegals are taking up is going to be fresh in people's minds. Again, I mentioned the schools, gas prices, uh, all those things, uh, and Biden's uh, historically low poll numbers. I think that uh, most polls that we see are usually slanted about five points in favor of a more liberal candidate and maybe five against Trump. So they're saying Biden and Trump numbers are about the same now. But considering that uh, natural skew, I think Biden's underwater. And uh, so the midterms for in the House, 
Uh, I've heard numbers as high as 40 seat pickup for the Republicans. I'm being a little more conservative. I'd say more than 20. If you remember, we were supposed to do more poorly in the last election, and we actually gained seats instead of losing 15 or 20 or 30. So I think we got some of our gains then, but I think we'll pick up the House. The Senate's an interesting map for us this time. You've got uh, states like uh, New Hampshire and, and Nevada, Arizona, uh, even Georgia that kind of went the wrong way for us. And we're trying to uh, pick up seats in the Senate there. So I think it's going to be a little more difficult. I do think in the end uh, that we'll gain the Senate. But, you know, the, the danger here is that we'll have a good majority in the House in theory. The Senate we could have control of, but we still have Biden in the White House. So as Republicans, we have a good message. Basically, we could go back to policies of two years ago and the country would look a heck of a lot better than it does now. So I think it's important that America understand that we can stop the bleeding, we can right the ship, we can get things headed in the right direction, but we need a Republican in the White House that will work with us in order to really evoke the change that I think is, is going to be necessary uh, to, to reunite this country and, and get things going in the right direction. One question more on the, on the midterms. What do you think that redistricting has done uh, for us? I mean, how many states were conservative? I mean, every, every state legislature gerrymanders their, their districts. People always make a big deal of that every year. Like, it's not happened since the beginning of time. It happens every time there's a census, every time there's redistricting. You and I went through that. And uh, what do you think is going to happen? Uh, and do we have enough conservative states where we might have artificially, for lack of a better word, picked up some seats uh, in some of those? I mean, are you counting those in the 20 or 30? What do you think about that? Yeah, no, I mean, as you look, I, 538 seems to be a pretty good resource on the redistricting. Uh, Nate Silver, I think that's who it is. He follows that pretty closely. And initially, it looked like Republicans were going to have some significant gains. You know, in Tennessee, it's possible uh, we'll pick up a, a seat in Tennessee 5. And by the way, I, I love your little meme that said, uh, breaking news, 12 people are not running in the 5th District or something to that effect. It struck me as funny because talk about a big tent. I knew it'd be a big tent, but it, it's a two or three circus tent. So um, to, to answer your question, I think if you look nationally, what they were able to do in, in some some states like New York and and uh, not so much California, Illinois, they've drawn out some Republicans too. So I don't know what the actual number is. I don't think it's a huge Republican advantage in redistricting, but the fact that the Virginia governor's race went the way it did, uh, I think things bode pretty well right now. People are fed up uh, with the policies. That, I mean, you, it's always the economy to some extent. In this case, it's a whole lot more. But uh, things are not going well uh, for the Biden administration. And uh, I'm, I think people are confused at why they hated Trump so bad. The media drove a lot of that. But if, if they look at uh, how things were uh, under his administration in, in terms of their prosperity and security, I think no one can really deny that it was a much better place. And, and so there's got to be some buy, buyer's remorse with Biden. Uh, he was their best, worst choice. And as we know, he seems to be sleeping his way through the first year. And we're not sure who's pulling the strings, but uh, it, it doesn't seem to be him. And, and his uh, backup, Kamala Harris, has been an absolute disaster. Yeah, that's interesting. To, that's been interesting to watch. I'm going to watch. I've never I've never watched the Democrats State of the Union. I, I'm a partisan hack. OK, I'll just go ahead and just just throw it out there. So I never watched, but I'm going to watch it. I'm going to watch it because I, it's got to be so bad that <laughs> I've just got to watch it. I've got to watch it. So I'm excited about that. Is there anything else that's going on up there? I know it's tough when you're in, in the minority. It's hurry up and wait. Uh, they call the shots. You get to go in to vote against everything that they're driving. Uh, but, you know, what else is going on up there that you'd like to share with anybody? Anything that, that folks uh, in Tennessee need to be aware of uh, that, that you're pushing? Anything that maybe they need to contact the other members of the delegation about or contact Senate members about? Uh, what, do you, what do you have for us? Yeah, well, I mean, my focus right now is a lot on foreign policy and the military. I was just with the Tennessee National Guard this weekend. And so uh, you know, it seems like most of my briefings and hearings right now deal, deal with national security. So th that's my focus at the moment. But, you know, statewide, we, we need to continue to work on, on getting our, our jobs expanded. People are moving to Tennessee. It's a good place to do business. So there's a lot worse place 
places to live than Tennessee. And I, I think we've got a good legislature. We've got a good governor and, and good members of Congress. So uh, the, the thing that I would advise, we do listen. And uh, when I get calls from constituents, it's really helpful because oftentimes what we get focused on and drilled on, down on here in Washington may be a little different than what's going on back home. So we really do appreciate the reach out to our staff and uh, field representative. So don't hesitate to call my office with anything that's of concern. I know er everything from education to you know, election security to energy and all that is, is on people's minds. But um, uh, for now, we're gonna get through the, this crisis in, in Europe and try to keep China at bay. And we got a farm bill coming up. So all the ag folks, uh, I'm, I'm your go-to guy there. And so, you know, let me know, let me know what's on your mind. And again, as always, I, I congratulate you again on, on this very incredible, successful launch. So I guess not really a launch anymore. It's a staple. The Tennessee Conservative uh, has been doing a great job. And I look forward to the emails I get. And uh, I, I know that uh, you, you didn't ask me to do this, but I know what you do costs money and to be on air costs money. And I, I've, I've donated to you and I want other people to donate to you. So we have good sources to combat the liberal media that we deal with in Tennessee. Well, you're very kind, and I will take that money. Uh, we're getting very close to break even this summer. We're going to be there. We're going to have to, you know, was a uh, physician heal thyself, consultant fundraise thyself. <laughs> That's what we're going to have to do this summer. Uh, Scott, I appreciate you very much. Uh, we enjoyed having you on the program. I appreciate you being a stalwart. And uh, and when push comes to shove, if Scott has to uh, vote the right way or get a committee assignment, he always represents his district. And if we had more of that in Tennessee at the state level, we would not have to push and prod so hard. Uh, but I appreciate you very much. Uh, for those of you who enjoyed this program, uh, please go to TennesseeConservativeNews.com uh, and subscribe or find us by searching Tennessee Conservative wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time, I'm Brandon Lewis, the Tennessee Conservative News, signing off.